There is always something to be said about having somebody speak for you in a room that you're not in. 100%. So, you know, if somebody mentions my name and I'm not in the room and they can be like, oh, Serena, she does this and she does that and she's known for this and known for that and, and so forth. That definitely helps you because the industry is so small. Mm. It's so small. You will cross fertilize and you will see people and you will work with somebody in one place. You'll leave that place. You might go to another place after that place and you'll end up working with people that you started off with. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to Nata with Neelan. Today, I'm speaking to a very good friend of mine who is also a diversity and inclusion specialist. Her name is Serena Lloyd-Smith. And here she is now. Serena, thank you very much for uh, joining me on my channel. First things first, how are you? What a question, Neil, and it depends minute to minute, hour to hour, day by day. At the moment, I'm all right. Yeah. It's been a roller coaster ride, as I'm sure it has been for everybody during these very strange times. But right now I'm okay. I've got health. I've got a roof over my head. I've got a job. I've got family. Everybody's safe. So that's how I will stick to it. I'm I'm all good. That's cool. Um, yeah. No. I, I feel like I'm I'm starting all my all my interviews like that. Um, obviously, a lot has gone on. Mm. Um, I think we're a lot less connected than we used to be, mm -hmm. um, and I definitely have get, got the sense that the people who have been working from home um who have been you know working throughout the pandemic have felt a sense of sort of isolation mm -hmm. so uh not only do i really appreciate the chance to have conversations and ask the important questions but also just to have that human interaction and talk about stuff that isn't work with non-work colleagues it is mm -hmm. a bit of a treat so yeah thank you very much for being here i really do appreciate it and i'm glad that you're you're doing so well and that your family's all good and healthy as well thank you <laughs> you're very welcome <laughs> um, so yeah today i wanted to, to talk a bit about sort of career navigation um mm -hmm. because i think that uh, the film and tv industry is one that is notoriously difficult to get into mm. but once you are in it it can be a hell of a lot more difficult to navigate your way around to navigate mm -hmm. your way across departments or across companies or to navigate your way upwards and try and build some sort of progression. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll take me back to the beginning. In terms of your career, what was the start of your journey? How did you get started working in film and TV? It was really interesting, actually, because I don't even really think that I should have been in film and TV because oh, really? um, I was a little bit of a maths geek. Mm -hmm. My whole childhood, I was good at maths. I was like top of my class. I did the GCSE. I didn't do too bad, actually. But when I, on reflection, I didn't do as great as I should have thought. But maths was still my thing. I thought I was going to be a financial advisor, like that I was good to go. I decided to do a maths A-level. And what a shell shock that was. It was like learning a foreign language. And then at the time as well, I also had a little bit of an issue with my, my teacher at the time. And so I really couldn't get what she was trying to teach. I was trying to move classes. And I think probably through pride, if I'm honest, she didn't want me to move classes because I was basically ranting about this other guy being better than her and, and his students seemed to be doing better than our students are doing. Um, so maybe I'm a bit cheeky, right? But anyway, so by the time I ended up moving the class, when I went to go and do the exam, the big piece of work that I didn't understand in her class took up most of the exam. So I failed my first year of my maths and I wasn't used to failing at anything. I was quite, you know, naturally sort of gifted at certain things. So it hurt. So, and I, I wasn't used to that emotion. So I was like, okay, well, I'm clearly crap at maths. I need to find something else. And media studies was my next highest grade. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do media studies. Then I ended up doing a film studies AS level. And media studies and again both of those and I ended up doing English as well both of those in English ended up being my top grades so I thought well okay well naturally if I'm going to go off to university because I was just a little bit like school college uni good job end off that's what I thought it was going to be I thought well okay well I go off and I do media then so I went to university I did um, media production and performance I got a 2-1 in my degree 
I came out of there thinking, right, so I know all there is to know about media because I've got two one in my degree. So clearly now I'm going to get the big job that I wanted to get. What a shell shock that was as well. So, you know, I obviously finished um, finished my degree in the September. I'm not going to tell my age, but I now finished my degree in the June and I didn't end up getting a job in the industry until probably like a year and a bit later. Mm next August so in that period I kind of was doing little jobs like data entry in certain companies but I was trying to keep it as media as possible so it was like an Australian business magazine where I was sort of compiling everybody's personal information and you know sending them out marketing and just hammering back in the days when you could hammer people without permission can't do that anymore um, and then I worked for a company that um sort of collated all the data the sort of TV viewing data and the um, radio data, newspapers, magazines, all that kind of stuff. So I was kind of like slowly trickling my way towards some kind of media, something or other. And then I ended up getting a job in post-production. I was like, there you go. This has something to do with my degree. So I'm going to get a job in post-production and this is, this is going to be the start of my career. Right. And again, with media as well. I only really knew of it as being sort of like a camera person or in front of the camera. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of the vast level of roles and input that you could have to this industry. I was clueless, right? So I went into post-production and needless to say, I was there for eight months and really figured out that post-production was not for me. <laughs> um, I think the place that I worked for in particular was quite difficult as well. It was a really difficult culture. Um, and it was really interesting what I dealt with in terms of being a diverse person within that culture as well. Mm. Um, so I wasn't very happy in that space. Um, and I guess being new in my career as well, I was naive to the workings of a business as well. So maybe kind of um, the way that I behaved against the grain also didn't go down too well so you're a diverse person you act against the grain you can clearly walk into certain stereotypes but I've always been a person who I don't like people to tell me no or I don't like people to put their limitations on me so you know somebody telling me that this is the best job that you'll ever get I will or I say I will I shouldn't say that anymore back then I would spite you <laughs> by basically being like okay I'll show you this is definitely not the best job that I can get that's kind of what I did to be fair I then was just like hammering my CV out to everywhere. I thought now I'm in post-production, I've got my foot in the door. So I must be able to get a proper job. Mm. Lo and behold, Channel 4 came knocking. I say Channel 4 came knocking. I came banging down the door and um, I got in there by hook or by crook and got a fantastic, what I call my first experience where they used to have a um, studio and post-production facility there. And it was a really mm. interesting time because when I got that job, and I handed in my notice to the previous job where I was, quote unquote, the problem child. Um, they weren't happy about that at all. They, they, they was trying to figure out how I got that job, who I knew. And I didn't. I was one of those people, you know, where I come from. You don't, people like us from where I used to come from just don't get jobs like that. It's like you, you can't quite connect. And we already know that in the media, it's been quite difficult to connect with your representation of yourself right so me getting that kind of job was a bit of a wake-up call for I guess them and the start of my career for me um so I kind of I guess I was very determined I know a lot of people that um did degrees alongside me you know I've got quite a few people that I know that have been quite successful but I know quite a few people that just you know media can be quite tricky can be very competitive um, I remember the first um, interview that I went to, the guy basically said to me, well, why do you want to do this? And I was like, I've done my degree. Like, this is, why are you asking me why I want to do this? I've just paid a lot of money to get into this industry. So he says to me, in this industry, you're not really going to get in unless you know someone that you're related to somebody. And I was so offended. I was it's like, the truth. Hey, it is the truth, though. I was like, <laughs> you, you cannot tell me that after I've just wasted three years doing this. I don't care what you say. Again, this is, you seem to sort of get the theme of me. I don't care what you say. I'm going to do it anyway, right? And I'm going to prove you wrong, right? So again, yeah, so I ended up getting in the, the industry that way. But it is a level of 
perseverance. It was absolute sheer perseverance back then as to how and why I got in. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think perseverance and resilience is, and I suppose determination is, are, are the qualities that you need um, to try and force your way in to, to an industry that does kind of feel like it's got its doors closed uh, for a certain section of society anyway. Um, and yeah, you've got to believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself and it's difficult because you're, you're putting your career and your hopes in the hands of people who you assume have your best interests at heart or are at least gonna um, give you an honest and fair go and that you're going into a meritocracy mm -hmm. where you are judged on your abilities and your talents, not on who you know or who you're related to. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that isn't always the case. And it's something that I think uh, the film and TV industry as a whole is trying to move away from. I think it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of people to admit uh, certain things mm -hmm. and, to, and to actively put in practices that will drive the industry away from that. Because I think the amount of productions coming over here, the amount of um, streamers especially that are, are making content over here, we have a massive supply problem. The, mm -hmm. the demand is massively outstripping the supply. And if, if you know, the, the people that employ people continually go to friends and family, there's not going to be people left to, to staff those productions. So I, there has to be uh, a real effort and drive to open this industry up to everyone. Mm -hmm. Because you, you don't need it's not a talent nepotism not is not a talent you don't need that to, to to work in this industry it's not like a a thing that it's not like the chosen few can only do this and everybody else you're not smart enough to do this or you're not you know good enough to do this so yeah <laughs> i see what you're saying and, and thank you very much for sharing your journey and your start um one thing that I've always uh, respected and admired about you is that you have an abundance of fantastic advice. You've always advised me very well. Um, while we were working together, you, you really, really uh, gave me a lot of fantastic advice. But even uh, once we weren't working together, you would always, you know, advise me on what to do, what not to do. And I was sort of wondering how you learn to navigate tricky situations, especially in this industry? Like who gave you the advice that helped you along your way and what advice do they give you? Mm. I've been really fortunate because I've collected some great people along the way. And when I think about some of the tricky situations that um, I've either been put in or, you know, people that I've worked with or for, um, it's been quite interesting. It's at the time when I was going through it, this is obviously, this is some years ago now, this is like, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago now. So obviously you do build up a level of, you know, skill and expertise and understanding of people and personalities and scenarios and how to navigate. Um, but back then it was really difficult. It was really difficult, but I was really fortunate. I think that my, my first manager at Channel 4 um, was absolutely phenomenal and he was one of my biggest supporters and I think about how long I technically worked for him for was probably about a year and a half and in the grand scheme of us now being like pushing 20 years into it um, he has always been one of my biggest cheerleaders in every position that I've gone for afterwards and even to this point every time I change my job he's like one of the biggest cheerleaders he was always somebody that I could go back to and just ask and just be my naive self and really just ask about what I can do what I can't do and then um, when I moved up into certain other positions I kind of learned how to be a good leader as well I kind of understood what traits made those managers that I really really gravitated towards what made them good leaders and it's not necessarily about managing people managing people and leading people are two completely different skills right so you know for example I had another manager again 
somebody that I can pick up the phone to now, somebody that I can drive to her house and visit her family. And she is one of my biggest supporters as well. When she managed me and say, for example, back then again, fresh faced and might have made some public mistakes. Cause obviously when you work in television, everything is quite, you know, public. Mm-hmm. She would never reprimand me in front of people. Like she would never um, tell me off. She would never, you know, kind of point out that I did something wrong. She would always give a really objective perspective. And then one-to-one, she would sit down and say, this is where you could have gone better. This is what you should have done. This is how we need to navigate this situation going forward. So I always respected the fact that she could really develop you and protect you at the same time. So we just built this infinite level of trust, which has always been with us. You know, we we kind of moved on from, you know, manager and employee to I consider her a really good friend, like really good friend. Um, so I've kind of collected those people along the way. But I will say that one of the things that's definitely been a help and one of the key um, things, that I think anybody coming into the industry, networking is key. So what I was talking about earlier on in terms of or what we were talking about in terms of knowing people or nepotism, again, the industry is trying to stamp that out, it's definitely trying to stamp that out. But there is always something to be said about having somebody speak for you in a room that you're not in. 100%. So, you know, if somebody mentions my name and I'm not in the room and they can be like, oh, Serena, she does this and she does that and she's known for this and known for that and, and so forth that definitely helps you because the industry is so small. Mm. It's so small, you will cross fertilize and you will see people and you will work with somebody in one place, you'll leave that place, you might go to another place after that place and you'll end up working with people that you started off with in different positions. You know, your, your, your career path might go like this as well. So you might find yourself, you know, you get a, a job slightly better and that person gets a job slightly better and then, mm you just create or you just kind of keep hold of your contacts and you move together I've got somebody I've got a really good friend who we always laugh about how how our CVs have gone we've kind of ended up being at the same places at different times she might move somewhere then I have ended up getting a job there then I might move somewhere and she ends up getting a job where I am and she's about to make another move and I'm like "Mm, does that mean I'm about to end up there just because our CVs have done that it's like Mm-hmm. Mm, does it mean that my my water is about to change as much? But we don't know. We we don't know. Um, but yeah, networking has been absolutely key, and I would say really keep hold of those people that really teach you and spend time with you and develop you because those people are really few and far between. So having those in your corner and just you know they kind of become informal mentors. Mentors is everything in this industry. Everything. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, people say that um, mentors are like the cheat code for life. Um, And while it's great to have those people in your in your career and in your life who sort of gas you up in the good times, they say, you know, great work doing this and this and this. Um, You know, here's a bit of advice on how to navigate this. Here's what I think you should do in this situation. What's also really important is having people around who um, stop you from doing the wrong things. There's been a few times where you have said to me, you're letting yourself down here or you're not quite, you're not quite handling this difficult situation in the way that I know you know that you should be handling it. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I never disputed it. Like, if I if I reacted in a certain way to something, and I told you about it, and you said, Neil, this is not the right way of doing it. I knew instantly <laughs> that <laughs> I messed up and that you weren't saying it for any other reason other than having my best interests at heart. We and used so, to have a saying, I can't remember where it was. The, the, the saying was, Serena is always right. And, and that is true. That is actually true. Serena is always right. They're, it's still undisputed. Um, <laughs> and now I've set the bar too high. Now I need to like keep my mouth <laughs> shut. But yeah. <laughs> no, but you, you've never, you've never steered me. You've never steered me wrong with the positive stuff. But also with the, uh, you, sh- you shouldn't be doing this. Or I understand your feelings, but 
you need to handle it better. You need to be a bit more smart. You need to be a bit more strategic mm -hmm. or just plain don't do that. Do this instead um, because mm -hmm. you always wanted the best sort of end scenario for me. You wanted me to navigate situations and get the best end result uh, for me. Um, not everybody is lucky enough to have that person in their mm -hmm. career. Um, someone who is going to be honest and you know forthright enough to say you've made the wrong decision here or you've not done the right thing here how important would you say it is to have that person around and how should people react when they're maybe told by such a person that what they're doing is not the right thing and therefore they should do it a different way instead if i was on like this um sort of trainee leadership scheme type thing um and one of the lessons that they gave us were about rocks and sponges. Okay. And obviously rocks, they are solid, they are formed, they are set. You can't really change them unless you break them, mm. hammer at them. And you've got sponges that, you know, you put them in water and they literally just absorb and absorb and absorb and absorb. And then they can kind of in and out and in and out. And one of the things that they taught us about just developing is always be a sponge take it be a sponge so whenever I have been given you know constructive criticism or been told how to act or how I could have done something um I've always tried and it's taken many years I'm not going to lie I didn't start off being able to do it well it took me some time um but self-reflecting on how I manage situations, how I handle situations. And again, I will say that I had people that were emotionally mature than me, that were professionally mature than me, and that did decide to guide me. And I guess the reason why I have been that way with you is because I always like to be the person that I wish I had. Okay. Like, I always want to be that source you always talk about paying it forward anyway I was desperate to get in the industry and I would have loved to have a person that helped me one person that helped me navigate the industry so I always think about back then when I was doing my degree and back then when I was navigating different jobs I would have loved to have that person and granted I've managed to get that along the years and along the way and I've got some I'm in a, a really fortunate position at the moment where I've got some fantastic people who you know, I'm, I'm very blessed to have, uh, you know, I can pick up the phone and, and get career advice. I can get mental advice. I can get life advice. Right. Um, but it is all about absorbing some things. There, there's going to be some things that you might not want to hear. But we kind of ha we have to learn. We have to learn. Sometimes you're going to be right. And sometimes you're going to be wrong. I remember when I, I, I yeah, I might not um, be as, um, illustrative with an example that I was going to give but I was really wrong and I was really wrong openly and publicly to an organization and I felt that I was in the right because I was in the right short term but in the long term I ended up giving myself a reputation which wasn't really the reputation that I wanted to land myself with so it ended up causing problems for me down the long run in that organization to the point where the only thing that I could have done was leave yeah, yeah. because my short-term winning of the battle lost me the war in that organization it's such an important thing and as I said not everybody's lucky enough to have it but if you do have it cherish it and definitely make the use of it and as Serena said pay it forward because the, the next generation people even slightly younger than you could really do with um, a bit of advice and a bit of guidance. And as you say, that person who sometimes does have to take you aside and not necessarily give you harsh words, but give you honest words um, <laughs> and, and say that certain ways of doing things aren't the right way. There's always a, there's always a better way of doing things, especially um, keeping in perspective the end result that you want in, in that role or you know, for your career in general. Um, I think and your reputation absolutely goes far as well your yeah. reputation can follow you it can follow you and it can go ahead of you so be very mindful to protect that yeah 
yeah you've got you've got to always protect the reputation that that can be difficult sometimes because i think amongst my sort of uh, friends and family they would maybe describe me in career situations as quite sensible quite level-headed but i am a person that wears my heart on my sleeve um i get as angry and as emotional as the next person um and if somebody treats me in a way that i don't particularly like or i think is just plain wrong i am going to react to that now mm -hmm. over the years i feel i've gotten better at handling that mm -hmm. i'm not perfect i'm not finished article um just in the last year alone i found a very difficult situation incredibly challenging to deal with and i've reflected on that a lot and i definitely would have done many things different but take it taking that lesson forwards uh, is the best thing because i can't i can't go back in time and change that but i can make sure i've learned the lessons i've learned from my mistakes and then you know in the next role that i do whatever challenges come across even if it's not the same thing there's always there's always similar lessons that you can um learn from i will make sure that whatever mistakes i make which i will i'll make new mistakes and i won't repeat the same mistakes i think that's that's some level of progress but uh -huh. yeah i guess i'm saying that having an emotional reaction to challenges at work is normal um but just learn from them and mm. try and as you say protect your reputation um and still stick up for yourself and mm -hmm. you know fight for your corner but yeah um just try and do things in a bit of a smarter way but having those people around you to give you that guidance and that advice will help you get there mm -hmm. um so i wanted to ask you about something in the in the film and tv industry that is quite difficult to talk about um mm. just for the reason that i think people find it a bit awkward and there's this sort of uh assumption that it will come from the manager uh, or that they should lead these types of discussions and that's uh, on progression um mm. uh, particularly with stuff like promotions and stuff like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if uh you're in a in a work environment where you feel that you've been working well and that you've been um, on top of your tasks and you also feel that you're ready to take on something new, you're ready to take on the new challenge, you're ready to take on more responsibilities and, you know, you've been eyeing up the chance for a promotion. What mm -hmm. is the right way about speaking to your manager to, to sort of start the process of uh, getting such an opportunity? That's a really interesting one because there is not a, a streamlined answer to that. And I think if I think about my previous maybe five or six years um, and looking at the people who were working particularly hard in particular roles that they have stayed in, in the hopes of getting progressed, again, you need to have that really good manager and again that's not to say that all managers who don't progress their team are terrible because again if you work for big organizations oftentimes there isn't the headcount there isn't the maneuver you know there has to be a big organizational shift for you to be able to even shift people into certain things in the first place um but i've kind of always always been taught by my informal mentors that every two to three years you should look to make a move, whether that's a move in your organisation or out of your organisation. So obviously Channel 4 was my first job. I was there for six and a half years. And when I left Channel 4, it was like, it was almost like, you know, a pregnant woman giving birth. I'd been, <laughs> I, was, I was the new baby and was out into the world. Channel 4 was my home. So anything outside of that, I thought I wasn't really going to be able to survive. But when I look at my career since then, um, it was the foundation. It taught me some very, very key things and skills that I still absolutely learn, absolutely use every day to this point, right? Um, but I have noticed that when I've been in certain situations, waiting to be noticed or waiting to be rewarded for my efforts, 
there has either not been the opportunities that the managers can give you or also leaving your progression into some in somebody else's hands is I don't want to say it's not the smart thing to do but I like to always be in control of everything about me so you know even when people look at my my CV now that they often say over my past five years they go oh that was a bit of a jump oh and the, oh so you you've done that and if I think about the times that I've had conversations with managers and been expressing how I feel like I can do certain things, there is a big difference between you telling somebody, I feel like I can do that, but they're used to how you are in your day to day. They're used to what you are in your capacity. So they kind of don't see you outside of that capacity. Sometimes there are rare occasions where managers do and do, you know, do um, give you opportunities if they get the opportunities but you often have to step out of those yourself. I remember it was probably, I feel like it was about six years ago now, it got to New Year's Day and I was just like, this is the last year that I'm gonna be an assistant. And everything I did, I don't know if it was about the law of attraction, but everything I put my hand to that year, I got myself a formal mentor, I was on, um, you know, a development program and I set myself a task and halfway through that year, I got an opportunity and it was kind of like an opportunity where I could go off and do an attachment in production. And I was like, right, OK, when I go off and do that attachment, I'm not coming back to that job. <laughs> so even <laughs> it was like six weeks for that attachment, but maybe in week two, I started applying for right. in-house yeah. jobs and external because I was like, I am not taking this step to go backwards. I've been waiting for this step. <laughs> and absolutely, I got a job two weeks before that attachment ended, obviously in the same organization, but it was complete and it wasn't an assistant role anymore. It was in a completely different department. It was a grade up at the time. So I was like, oh my goodness. And that that process for me when I saw how I was able to do that then within a year I also did it again went up another grade and then start moving into a different position so I was like this is how that works then right. That's how yeah. do that. so when I got used to that and sort of shifting there's a book that I read called um lean in which is I can't remember she was like quite a high um figure she, like I want to say Cheryl a lady in Facebook and in the book, she talks about um, career ladders are no longer ladders. They call them jungle gyms <laughs> because you don't, <laughs> now you don't just go up. Sometimes you sidestep to upstep. So when I then started to open my mind to that, thinking about, okay, you know, I might not be able to go for my manager's job, but I can go for a position that builds on the expertise that I've got at the moment and fills the gaps that I could need to move to that next position it's better to sidestep to upstep so I started to do that a lot and found that I just went like that a lot quicker yeah the the, the crux of what you're saying is have it always in your own hands have your career progression in your own hands I think it, like I said before I think it is awkward because people I think back in the day you would just wait for your manager to say you're ready to step up or I, I, I have more responsibilities that I want to put onto you. Um, I, I think your role should be this now. I mm -hmm. think nowadays it is, the onus is on the employee. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say that uh, some managers don't look at you and go, right, I think now is the time to, to mm -hmm. give you a new challenge or now it's time to give you more responsibilities. But yeah, I definitely think it is on the shoulders of the employee to to drive their career um mm -hmm. which is exciting but it's also quite daunting especially in your early the early part of your career mm -hmm. you sort of feel like well who am i what have i done mm -hmm. to sort of mm -hmm. deserve this and then you start comparing yourself to other people that you know or other people um in the same company and everyone's journey is different and mm -hmm. everybody isn't able to sort of get the same things or at, or get the same things at the same time mm -hmm. um so yeah, I, I, I think knowing that 
your journey is different to everybody else's is, is really important and always hold, holding on to that because it can be difficult and I think it is natural to compare yourself to other people but mm-hmm. yeah I think everyone has to do things at their own pace um, and if you feel like you're ready to take on more responsibilities and ready for a new challenge but a promotion isn't on the cards because sometimes the position the next position up for you doesn't exist or someone's uh, already occupying that position and they're not going anywhere anytime soon and they're not gonna be promoted above where they are so sometimes a promotion at that uh, company isn't possible and you don't feel like you want to take a sidestep um, outside mm-hmm. of that company or you know into a different industry something that might um be a good incentive or a kind of progression is to ask for a pay rise mm-hmm. um, and that could be even more awkward than a promotion because normally a promotion comes with a pay rise so you don't even have mm-hmm. to have that conversation it's, it's normally part of it it's normally automatic but failing uh not having a promotion asking for a, a pay rise uh can be can be quite awkward um so i mm-hmm. want to ask you how what's the right way of of starting the conversation uh to talk about money and to potentially ask your manager for a pay rise yeah i've got kind of two scenarios i think um earlier on in my career i had a scenario where there were lots of assistants doing similar things. Some assistants were getting paid more than others. Some titles were slightly different to others. And I was kind of paying close attention and I was like, hmm, I do what that person does, but that person's got that title when they get paid more than me. Um, again, at the time, I was really comfortable with my manager. So I was a bit like, how do I ask you this? But I've noticed this. So she says, okay, well, what you can do is you can kind of go through your job spec, go through that job spec, and we can tally up how what you currently do matches up with that job spec. Kind of build a business case. Sure. And sure. Build a business case. And it got approved because I was doing exactly what that new job spec said. So that was the first time that I learned that pay kind of is negotiable, right? And she helped me with that anyway, because she kind of was like, okay, you can't just go in and say, I think I deserve. You have to present a business case. Nobody's going to get, nobody's going to, you know, buy a cake from you, but they've never seen your products. (laughs) Just like, you know, it just doesn't happen. I say that as a cake maker in the background. But um, yeah, so then, but then I've had another scenario where I've worked for a a bigger organization where it's a lot more difficult to negotiate pay. And again, what I had to do was I had to demonstrate that the pay that I came in on and my remit had expanded so much that even the pay that I was on in the first place was still kind of low for the position that I was in. Again, a business case had to be put forward and luckily that also got approved. Okay. But... um, I remember a lady that I worked with at Channel 4, again, when I was talking about how the industry ends up being so small, we've ended up at the same place again. But she gave me a really key piece of advice when I was about to leave Channel 4. And we were talking about salary negotiation. And obviously you go into you go into this job interview and it shows you this salary. So you think, OK, it shows you this salary. So I have to take this salary. And she said to me, every salary is negotiable never go for never go for what's offered to you and I was like I can't really do that so she said to me contact me personally every time you need to negotiate the salary and I thank her to this day because again I have noticed that you know 95% of the times I've always been able to shift a salary but again that is about informal mentors having conversations with people who have been there and done what it is you want to do where they can kind of, they can kind of um, guide you through what they've done in order for them to get to a certain position as well so um yeah I would always say that you know make sure that you've got a business case around it so make sure that you can demonstrate 
you can demonstrate that you're already doing what you do, but you can demonstrate that you are over excelling in other areas as well. Mm -hmm. And also what you bring to that organization, what it is that you bring that you're worth that extra spend? Because it's always gonna be an investment. They always want to get back what they put in as well. So as much as you want from somebody, it's, it's a very much a give and take relationship. You know, it has to work both ways. Wow, that, that, that was really insightful. And I think a lot of people are gonna find that information useful. Um, can you actually say what that mentor of yours did? So if you would say, I'm, I'm, go, I'm, I'm going for this job, um, they've offered me this amount, what would she do to break it down and help you negotiate something different? That one didn't give me the level of um, breakdown that another one ended up giving me. The one that when I said about six years ago, it literally all changed in that year. Yeah. So for that specific company that I worked for, she told me the parameters that, you know, literally under a certain amount, it doesn't need to go to a certain place to get approval. So right. you can negotiate from naught to this figure. Mm. Always shoot just above that figure. <laughs> So that when you are negotiating your way backwards, there's always going to be like a halfway point. So you kind of need to, you kind of need to make peace with sometimes what you want is not going to be what you get, but you need to have had a happy compromise. Mm -hmm. So I remember even my next um, mentor that taught me the next sort of level of negotiation in the moment, when I was going for a certain job, she told me to go for a figure and I went for like two or three grand more than she told me because I was like, yeah, let me try it then. And I ended up getting more than we thought that I was going to end up on because I was like, oh, yeah, well, guess what? I kind of did that and ended up getting that. So she's like, well, there you go. So, um, yeah, I think it's just about you need to you need to in your mind because I've also taken pay cuts to come into certain organizations as well. But the reasons why I've taken a pay cut is because I've looked at the organization, the reputation, what that job spec will do for me. So will it, you know, will it end up paying me back what I've lost from coming from this organization to this organization? So for example, at the time I took, I think it was about a, a two and a half grand pay cut. And at the time, obviously I was an assistant. So that's quite a, quite a, a big chunk for an assistant. But what that position ended up doing for me in the next couple of years was just like, it was worth that pay cut. Yeah. So it's all got to make sense. It's all got to make sense for the bigger picture of what you want. You should have a percentage in mind that you'll be happy with. And you should always know, you should, you should always go push the limit, <laughs> push, you know, you think, oh, I'll be, I'll be happy with that. If you say I'll be happy with that, go two to three grand higher than that then. Because it will get you closer to where you'll be happy. Definitely. As opposed to getting them that as the first answer, because you'll you'll always be lower than that. Yeah, I mean that's when you when you start off in the early part, parts of your career, and I've been guilty of this. The first number somebody says, you go, Yep. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. no, I'll, I'll I'll take it. Mm -hmm. And then they go, Yeah, great. And you just think, oh. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. why didn't mm -hmm. I at least say something else? Why didn't I at least mm -hmm. have a conversation rather than give a one word answer that didn't even question how further that conversation could have gone? Um, mm -hmm. But I suppose you live and learn. And the, yeah, the biggest takeaway I will um, remember is, as what you said, every salary is negotiable. Yep. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Su such a such a really great thing to remember um, and I must also add as well I had um, had another manager at one time say to me you know what do you expect and I was like uh, I thought, well, that's really you don't want to say to your new manager what you expect because you don't want to then shoot yourself in the foot and not get the job because you've gone way higher mm -hmm. and she ended up saying to me I'm a budget holder so I need to know really what it is you want. I'm not going to promise you that I'm going to be able to match it, but at least I, you know, I have the authority to try and do something about it. 
So I guess in my mind as well, it's always, I, I always kind of keep that little bit in mind with are you dealing with a budget holder or are you dealing with somebody that's kind of, you know, like a level from your budget holder or how does that work? So the, the level of negotiation that you can have and if it can actually make a difference, if they can make a difference. Definitely. Um, I was going to say something that I think all of us have to do at some point is leave uh, a job, leave a company, leave a role. Um, and I've just started to think more and more uh, in depth about how you should conduct yourself once you leave. So uh, normally, I think for most places, depending on how long you've worked there, if once you hand in your notice and obviously let them know that you're going to be leaving, you would tend to have maybe a month, a month or two um, of notice you've got to serve. And generally speaking, you know, you do a handover with the person who's coming in to replace you. You say your goodbyes. Um, you sort of uh, email around, asking to uh, keep in touch, maybe do sort of leave and drink, stuff like that. What in your mind should be the things that people do in their remaining weeks and days um, at a company. Is this when you're leaving on good terms or bad terms? I, I, would, <laughs> I, would, I, I would say both and see if there's any difference there because I think we've all been in both situations. So when you're leaving on good terms, it's really easy because it's just kind of like, you know, you're going off and you're progressing your career, but you're naturally going to keep in touch because you really enjoyed working with the people that you enjoyed working with. So I would think naturally people would want to keep in contact with you, right? If you're leaving on somewhat bad terms, again, what I have noted is reputation is everything and it will follow you and it's a small industry. So... I would always say be dignified. Always make sure that you have carried yourself with good morals mm -hmm. and good values and know that oftentimes more than not, you will see these people again. So just let your success speak for itself. Just always carry yourself in a certain way. Be respectful. Don't let anybody ever question your character always do the right thing definitely when they go low you go high yes <laughs> and like, is, it, is it worth sort of emailing around to people um saying let's let's keep in touch and actually following up on that and and continuing to sort of keep in touch with the people you used to work with once you're at your new role I mean, I always do send out a sort of leaving email in every position that I've been in. I've left a leaving email um, and said, here is my contact information if you'd like to keep in touch, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, especially if you're leaving in, in a certain, um, in a tricky kind of space, you don't, you don't want to be like, hey, you know, I didn't mess with you while I was there, but now we can mess with each other oh, afterwards. Yeah. I've, I've had somebody do that to me where, you know, they didn't treat me particularly well in the job and then they left and then they were trying to add me to all the socials. I'm a human being. I'm like, you didn't treat me particularly nicely when we worked together, but now you want to follow me. What does that mean? Like, because all that means is I want to keep my eye on you. It doesn't mean that there is mm. anything genuine that can come out of this connection. So that connection didn't happen personally. But anyway, so um, I would always say, I would always give people the option to stay in touch because again, it you know, you don't want to kind of go deuces, like don't want to see you again. Mm -hmm. Give it the option because again, when people are in certain working environments as well, it really depends, like the team that I'm in at the moment, I've probably been able to be the nearest to my whole self as I've been able to be for many years, right? So when you move into different positions, you might find that, that your character kind of changes when you go to a different position. And the people who you didn't necessarily gel with in that particular job because you weren't happy in that particular job, you might actually create a bit of a better relationship outside of that space because now you're more yourself. Yeah. Now they can kind of see you for who you really are. And it's like, oh, okay, I can build a real genuine relationship with that person. Definitely. Yeah, keep it genuine. Yeah. 
yeah you can you, you can definitely keep it genuine but always just just always just maintain your dignity mm. you know when I was younger I I did like to do quite a few mic drop moments I I, I did like to do that um to be fair, it's quite good that it hasn't come back on me. They weren't terrible, but it was just, you know, when you, you're treated a certain way in certain scenarios, you kind of want to leave your presence. But I've always tried to do it, mic drop moment, but also have gone to something better before I do the mic drop moment. Yeah. And it kind of always helps in that, thank goodness. If, it, if I wasn't leaving to something better and I always do a mic drop and walk away and then have no job, different story. Can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Can't do that. I always, I, I think, if you ever say the phrase, do you know what? It, it kind of feels like you're leading into trouble. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're in a situation, in a work situation, and someone's speaking to you and you don't like it, or they're treating you in a certain way, and you, you say the word, do you know what? It, it always feels like it's going to go down that left path. <laughs> um, so I always try and re refrain from using the phrase, do you know what? Because I know where it, where it could lead me. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's always best, I suppose, to leave with your, with your head held high. And as you say, to, to know that you've always done the right thing, that you've treated people the right way, that you've handled the situations um, appropriately. And yeah, when it's when it's time to, to depart, um, you do so on your terms and you speak to the people that you want to speak to for the right reasons. Um, mm -hmm. Serena, thank you so much for joining me today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you. I think, <laughs> you're very welcome um i think uh the audience is gonna really enjoy your insight and and hearing your experiences and how you've handled situations and how you've navigated your way through um this very very challenging industry to, to doing what you're doing today um a lot of people might want to uh follow you on social media or contact you to, to ask advice or maybe even ask you to mentor them um are, are you on social media is it something that people can I'm on social media. Actually, what I've what I've just um, joined is Clubhouse. Oh, really? <laughs> so, so everybody seems to be on Clubhouse, and I seem to, yeah, like I enjoy being on Clubhouse at the moment. Um, I am on. I always have to remember my handles, so I might have to give you my handles, and yeah. you might have to tag in the video. Um, but yeah, do when you spot me, when you when you get the tag, do do follow. Find me on Clubhouse. And I'll be talking in some rooms, hopefully. It's quite addictive. It's really strange. At first, when somebody said to me, oh, it's an audio only like social platform, I'm like, who just wants to sit and talk? But I've been jumping into rooms and it's the most fascinating, fascinating conversations. It can be about anything. It can be about anything. I Well, I saw on Twitter, I say, I say I'm not on Twitter often, but I did see on Twitter that um, somebody had a baby on Clubhouse and people were... We're talking her through delivery. <laughs> what is going on on Clubhouse? I, 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 I've heard of it. I don't know too much about it. I've heard of it. Have, um, you got a, have you got an iPhone? Yeah. So it's for iPhone users only at the moment. I think they will right. take it over to Android. It's invite only as well. So I might spare you an invite. <laughs> you can take a look for yourself. <laughs> But it's, you know, like, it's, I, I say that, that was an extreme case, but I've been in, in rooms with billionaires talking about how they started their businesses and just like wow. social media influencers and YouTube stars and talking about what they did and fascinating. You know, I've got a, a cousin who's, you know, a, a, a vegan, but she's got a very nice little professional business around vegan. I told her, get yourself on Clubhouse and the minute I invited her to Clubhouse, she started opening rooms and speaking on stages. I call them stages. So the minute you start speaking on the stages, your your followers it increase. And you know, I'm like, get in. Wow. Get yourself on uh, Clubhouse. <laughs> Might have to check it out. Well, guys, we're going to uh, we're going to put the links down in the description, um, so you can follow Serena on social media. Indeed. Serena, thank you very much for your time. I've really really appreciated you uh, you jumping on the channel. Um, Guys, let me know what you think of this interview. I'm going to be doing a lot more interviews in the coming weeks and months. I'm going to be speaking to a lot of really interesting, talented people who have been very, very generous with their time um, to, to come on the channel and speak with me. If there are any questions um, that sort of came up uh, once, you've, once you've watched these interviews that you, you'd want to ask my guest, um, 
write them down below and then I could uh, message my guests and then ask them for you and then I can comment below that with, with the answer. So yeah, see you guys later.